So I've been asked to talk then about um, uh, the impact of uh, multi-center study groups as well as uh, give a little overview of the work that we've done uh, then through the ISSG. So here are our disclosures and then please note the third line down the research support uh, that we've received from the ISSG um, and we owe much of it to our sponsors. So if, it's interesting, if you look at then uh, high impact research, right, um, going through the literature, it, it came initially from Spine, probably from Twin Cities in Minnesota as well as a Wash U as of most recently. But then also if you look at then some of the efforts that have done in orthopedics in general, right, at shock trauma and Harvey View, and then more recently I think looking at the multi-center study groups, the SDSG, harm study group, and then more recently again our efforts to the ISSG, you know, what does this really do to? I think it's due in large part due to large collaborative membership. And so I think that you get a high volume um, in these groups, but it's much more than just cases and high volume of cases. It's this concept of collaborative intelligence and the ability that we can work together and that one uh, mind, if you just work in isolation, all you do is highlight your deficiencies. Whereas if you can then work together and work together with the team, it tends to just highlight your strengths as opposed to your weaknesses. And as you'll see in our productivity, you go through this process of machine learning where as you work together more and more and more, you become faster and faster and faster and progressively more productive. And I think that this concept then of these study groups has really, really defined or redefined academic medicine. And so if you then are part of an institution then that you've created as opposed to that's been created around you, um, you're much more nimble and so as a consequence you have much more diversity both in the cases as well as the collaborators which then gives a much more diversity in terms of the ideas and you have probably a little less bureaucracy to deal with and also then more of an ownership of the group as well as especially the data. And so what I've been asking to do then in light of all this is again an overview of our structure, uh, the work that we've done in our enrollment to date, uh, look at our productivity, and then I've been asked to review just some selected efforts on our part uh, for thoracolumbar lumbar alignment. Uh, please note that I'm not going to review the cervical MIS complications or economics. That's been a huge part of our group, and the people that are invo uh, involved in those efforts uh, uh, deserve huge accolades. And then I'll probably then look at some of the next steps where we're going to go or looking to go uh, from uh, a work standpoint. So, so here's our structure and here are our groups uh, right now. We formed our own uh, 501C3 in 2010, so our own uh, non-for-profit uh, foundation. The way it works is each site then has their own study coordinator. All the data then is loaded from that site onto an online database. We then take the radiographs for the patient enrollment and then also load them online to a central spot. Those radiographs are then measured in a standardized fashion and then also goes into the database uh, to control for all of it. Each site has its own study coordinator that's responsible for all this. And then we also have a central mechanism, namely uh, one central coordinator, Ray Marla Pinteric, who is absolutely wonderful and then two full-time assistants, and we also have accountants in our own legal team that works on this. So now at this point, we're about 18 sites, quite a few sites, and then um, uh, a site in Japan that we work with in Tokyo, and then we collaborate with the ESSG. I realize we're the ISSG, but it's kind of like the World Series. Even though we say the World Series, it's not really across the world. So our international group, even though we say we're international, we're not really international. It's based in the U.S. And then we collaborate with uh, also some uh, groups in Ghana as well as Korea. And so the way that we've then done this now and, and try to run it then as a business is that we've broken down into these different working groups you can see here as we then analyze the data because we've gotten too big uh, just for one uh, one kind of mishmash then of, uh, of papers or efforts. And so then we have each uh, uh, working group leader then organize that group effort. And you can see now the studies that we've done to date, um, about nine studies here and enrolled about 2,600 patients, a little bit more. Uh, uh, at the end right now, we're funded for about 5,000 patients through 2022. Uh, so this list is going to keep growing, we anticipate. So here's our productivity. Uh, from an SRS and IMAS uh, submission. There's a, a yeah, you can see here, was there a, uh, how'd you get the mouse on there, Cal? Oh, it was on your computer, oh, wasn't it? Fine. Yeah. So you can see uh, this jump. This is when we first started enrolling patients in the database, and you can see we kind of pumped along. And then we had this big jump from 12 to 13, and then another big jump from 13 to 14. 
And it's probably due to two things. One, this is where we started getting two-year follow-up in our database, but also shows that now we're starting to be able to click more as a machine, right? And this is this process then of machine learning as we made these two big jumps from a productivity standpoint. And then right at about kind of 75 to 90 abstracts, which we are uh, per year now, that's probably kind of you max out per year, which is quite a bit. So here's our SRS, here's our NAS productivity, um, about 90 abstracts this year, 84 last year. We found that uh, in the past two years, we've accounted for 67% of anything that says deformity for NAS. So two thirds of anything that has deformity in the title is coming from the ISSG at NAS. And I thought, hopefully you can see this. What we did then uh, was look at the productivity for different study groups or institutions um, and then compared that to most recently. So we have uh, 1976 to 1990, here's the Twin Cities group, here's our productivity, very story group you can see, uh, really dominated the podium at that time. And then here's the Wash U group, huge impact from 95 up till now in orange. You can see they kind of blipped up and then blipped down a little bit. Uh, the Harms group you know, focuses here on yellow, um, more on AIS. So despite having a huge impact just in AIS, they only have so much they can present on. But again, I think very influential. And then you can see here that is ISSG kind of clicked along. And in the past, say, three years, we've done a fairly good job um, from an overall podium power uh, standpoint. So I think that time will tell. You, know, you can see the lasting impact that WashU has had. As of recently, we've had an enormous impact in terms of productivity. But time will tell if we can continue to maintain that, which I hope we do. And then here in our man manuscript productivity, uh, averaging about 25 manuscripts per year. I have about 120 uh, for our group. And so then what I'll do then is what, what, what we've tried to do in the, our group is to try to tell a story within each study group or within each uh, general topic. And so then uh, I've been asked to talk about thoracolumbar alignment. And so I'll kind of begin this with what we first looked at was this traditional teaching that scoliosis is not painful. And I think that all of us heard this in medical school, or you, you get this in your teaching. And, and where did that really come from? It came from uh, two Sentinel stories, or uh, uh, papers from Stu Weinstein in, in JAMA in 2003, and then in JBGS in 2000. And what he did in those, in those papers is he compared late onset idiopathic scoliosis, which was then, then transferred onto ASD, or old spinal deformity. So untreated late onset idiopathic scoliosis to controls. And what he found, Comparing those two groups, the late onset idiopathic scoliosis patients, even though they had more pain and cosmetic problems compared to the controls, about 68% of them had little or moderate pain, which is actually similar to the controls. And so he also found it had no effect on function or, or, uh, or marital status. And he concluded this with this very bold statement that says it's essential then for the community and physicians and the public to recognize that late onset idiopathic scoliosis, which was then, then transferred onto ASD, is likely to cause little physical impairment other than back pain and cosmetic concerns. And so the translation for that is probably adult spinal deformity is not really painful and that treatment's probably unnecessary in adults. And this has had this lasting impact on our field and it's a hurdle that we continue to have to jump through with the third party payers, with the government, with community physicians, and other physicians in the community as well and that don't understand the nuances, I think, of alignment and adult spine deformity. But if you look at some of the problems then with the Stu Weinstein studies, first he had no standardized health related quality of life metrics that he measured in those studies. He used a modified pain score, modified depression function, as well as modified cosmesis scores. But more importantly, in those studies, there was no sagittal plane analysis. In fact, we wrote him and then asked them then to relook at that data, and they have no lateral radiographs on any patient in that study. And we know that sagittal malalignment is the primary cause of pain and disability in adult spine deformity. Yeah, exactly. But but it shows a huge hole in then the data that we have. But we had this enormous mountain then to overcome because of prior data that was incomplete. And so it's the onus is then on us 
to try to reverse that and demonstrate then this newer data that shows that there were some errors. Despite a fairly decent study, there were some errors in those studies. So if you look at our research needs then, what we wanted to do is quantify the impact of adult spinal deformity. And so we published this this past year after compiling uh, three different abstracts. And we took about 500 uh, uh, spine patients that had no prior surgery. And then we took their SF36 scores, compared them to the population norm, as well as to other disease states. And what we found is that for every single age group, the adult spinal deformity patients were below the 25th percentile compared to the age norm. So a very large impact to population norms. But there was also a more abrupt decline in their function and their SF36 PCS, the physical component store, their SF36 PCS scores compared to the general population. So not only a generational impact, but a massive impact over time for this patient population. And then if you compare then the disease impact of ASD to other chronic diseases, we found it had a similar impact as cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. But the problem though with adult spinal deformity, as we know, it's a heterogeneous disease, right? There's different types of deformities. Deformities in the coronal plane, in the thoracic spine, in the lumbar spine. There's moderate to severe sagittal plane deformities. So then what we did is we parsed out those different deformity types and then used their SF36 scores and again compared them to population norms and then also compared them to more chronic diseases. And what we found, which I think that we know fairly well by now, is as you go from the thoracic spine to the lumbar spine, more disability. And as the sagittal plane malalignment increases, again, more disability. We then took those different deformity types and then compared them to different diseases. And it's interesting. So here's the US general population from the SF36. And here is the summary of that first study, ASD versus cancer and diabetes. But now here are the different deformity types, main thoracic curve, lumbar curve, moderate and severe sagittal malalignment, et cetera. And this part of the graph right here encompasses Stu Weinstein's study, right? Isolated main thoracic curve US versus the US population and back pain. Similar impact. But unfortunately, that's where Weinstein stopped. So then if you then look at a lumbar curve, it has a similar impact as osteoarthritis, which is extremely well-funded, as well as a similar impact as heart disease. But then as we start layering in sagittal malalignment, it's about similar to a person who has rheumatoid arthritis in the 25th percentile. If we do severe sagittal malalignment, functioning similarly to somebody who has severe pulmonary function and near blindness, and if we also then uh, layer in a patient that has severe sagittal malalignment and a lumbar curve, they're functioning worse than an amputee. So enormous impact that can't just be encapsulated by a main thoracic curve. We then took that data and then we wanted to have these different signature types then of, dis of deformity types and then compare them again to diseases. So when somebody saw a radiograph, you think, well, this is probably how they're functioning. So if you take this first patient, 35 year old, Right, isolated thoracic scoliosis. This is the Weinstein patient. This is the Weinstein study here, right? Her PCS is 57, disease correlate, normal function for age. But then if you take this patient here, 63-year-old, really no scoliosis, sagittal malalignment, her PCS is 20. What's the disease correlate? It's an amputee functioning below the 25th percentile. Enormous disability, but the insurance company has no clue about what that means for that patient. Then if you take then this same patient, but then you layer on the lumbar curve, right? So severe sagittal malalignment, as well as lumbar scoliosis, his PCS is 13. Well, the correlate for him is there's actually no correlate. He's functioning worse than a blind patient. He's functioning worse than an amputee. And he's functioning worse than somebody in lung failure. So it has an enormous impact. So you can't lump everybody into one specific disease type. So the question is then, what is an, an ideal sagittal spinal pelvic malalignment? And I think that these, uh, these two pictures from uh, Frank Schwab's study, they're a little pixelated, I apologize about that. But I think those have been driven home and, and replicated again and again and again, right? We all know SVA less than 50, 
pelvic tilt less than 20, and lower doses gap less than 10, right? The problem, though, with this, which you'll see in a second, we, this was initially put out by Frank in SPINE in 2010, and then we validated this with the ISSG in SPINE 2013, looking at patients with an ODI of 40 and what their alignment was for an ODI cutoff of 40, and again, we found those same numbers. Pelvic tilt 20, SVA 45, lower doses gap about 10, right? So that makes sense. So we have a general sense of what alignment maybe should be. And then Femi Protopsaltis uh, and the ISSG put this out in 2014, uh, measuring the T1 pelvic angle, which is aligned from T1 centroid down through the bicoxal femoral axis in the femoral heads, and then a line that goes through the center of the sacrum. The um, benefit of this is it's an angular measure. It doesn't depend on calibration of the radiographs. And also, it's independent of pelvic tilt, unlike SVA. So if I'm sagittal aligned and I'm pitched forward, right, that's my SVA, I can retrovert my pelvis and bring my head back over my pelvis, right? So this is somebody with increasing pelvic tilt, and you can see it brings the SVA back. Whereas the TPA, that same centroid through the bicoxal femoral axis up to the sacrum remains the same despite increasing pelvic tilt or pelvic retroversion. So it's a fairly consistent uh, measure. And we found linear worsening in health related quality of life with worsening or increasing TPA and a stronger correlation um, with ODI, SF36, and SRS22R uh, compared to uh, lower doses gap, SVA, and um, and pelvic tilt. Target TPA really should be about 14 degrees. So then if you want to drive home some measures, SVA 50 or 5, do millimeters or centimeters, lower doses gap 10, pelvic tilt 20, right, and TPA uh, 14. So then if we have those measures then, can we then plan to actually achieve post-operative alignment for our patients if we're going to do a reconstructive procedure? And what is the real value in planning? So then what we did is we looked at our, our alignment rates uh, from a pedicle extraction osteotomy standpoint. And what we found is that the members of the ISG were doing a terrible job of realigning patients. We found about 33% had good alignment. And about 67% of patients in our cohort were either undercorrected or overcorrected. It's like, oh my God, we have 67%. How can that be? And what we found, we wrote this up in Spine 2013, is that we found is very simply the undercorrection had a very large deformity, and the overcorrection had a very small deformity. We then looked further at this, and we uh, published this in, in Spine 2012, in the European Spine Journal also in 2012, looking at over and undercorrected patients. And what we found is that, in general, you're going to get about 28 degrees of correction from a PSO. We know that pretty much. And you also get an SVA correction about 90 millimeters. We know that pretty much as well. But if we look at the PSO failures comparing to the PSO successes, the level of the PSO is the same. The PSO resection angle was the same. The change in SVA and lordosis gap was also the same for those patients. So what that means is, despite the patient's deformity, what was happening is everybody that was coming through the door was getting the same surgery. So if you don't plan, you're going to have about a 67% rate of over or under correction, right? So if I have a 67% rate of failure, someone's going to come in my door and shut me down, right? And one of the things then, if you look at risk factors, if you're going to do a PSO, if you have an SVA over 200, a tilt greater than 40, or a lerosis gap more than 45, you're going to have to do more. A PSO is not going to get you there, and you have to look at yourself and your institution and say, well, can I actually do this surgery? But also then drives home the need to plan out these surgeries. So now we have, as we're telling a story, right, we go through, we have ASD causes disability, depending on the type then of the deformity. And then we say, well, what alignment do I need? And we have some pretty good guidelines, we think, at least for now, for alignment, which I'll address later, but maybe not be the best guidelines. And also shows then that we actually need to plan out for their surgeries. So then the question is, can we actually plan these out? And it's funny, there's been a number of prediction formulas that have been put out there. Uh, Keith Bridwell and Pete Rose 
uh, put out a few, and Steve Onder put out a few with this trigonometric formula. But we've seen then from these prior then uh, slides, what you have to do is you have to consider the spine in totality, the pelvic parameters, as well as the spine as a dynamic system. The problem with Steve Andra's trigonometric formulas is it considers the spine as a rigid element, and it doesn't consider the unfused segments. So then Virgin Lafage wrote this up in Spine 2011, and then we in the ISSG validated this in Spine 2013, or actually JNS Spine 2013. And what we did is put out this formula and then compared it to actual alignment following a PSO. And what we found, our prediction error was about four degrees for pelvic tilt, about 27 millimeters for SVA, with about a 75% positive predictive value and about a 98 negative predictive value. And the unique features of this formula then are going to be an initial calculation of the pelvic tilt, namely how much the patient is going to retrovert their pelvis in order to correct the spine, right, if you're undercorrected, or if you have a very large deformity and you're still retroverting your pelvis, it means you have a massive deformity. And then it also uses age as a surrogate then for reciprocal change, right? Because the older the patient is, as Bob Hart talked about, the more likely they're going to be unable to maintain the alignment that you then dial in. We then took that same data from that validated formula that we performed. We then compared it to other previously published formulas, and Justin Smith and the ISSG wrote this up in Spine in 2012. And what we did then is model the accuracy of these different formulas. Here's Keith Bridwell's, Steve Andres, Bridwell's again. This is a formula that Frank Schwab put out. And then here's Virginie's formula. And we compared good versus poor SVA and actual SVA. And what we found then is the formulas that only looked at regional parameters, right? So if you just cut wedges in your radiograph and kind of mount them together, you have a very poor positive and negative predictive value and may predispose to a poor outcome. If you then look at pelvic morphology, namely pelvic incidence, as well as the regional formulas, you do a better job. But we found that Virginie's formula best predicted good and poor SVA, as well as best predicted actual SVA, again, because it considers the patient as a whole, pelvic retroversion, age, as well as spinal alignment. But the problem, though, is does one size fit all? And this is what Bob, I think, was talking about. And what are the consequences of this? And what we're finding now is we told everybody to dial in these three or these four parameters. And what we're finding now is that one size does not fit all. So in order then, we put out these guidelines, right, and these, these alignments that we should shoot for, but we're probably overshooting for these patients. And so many of them are falling over the top and can't maintain that alignment. So clearly alignment is a piece to the puzzle, but it's not the entire puzzle. So if you look at solutions then, we need to look at alignment thresholds as well as risk-benefit ratios for actually maintaining or obtaining those alignment, and what happens if you over or undershoot, as well as failure prediction models, as well as identify prophylactic measures then for junctional failures. And so um, we put this out, at Reynold Lafage in the ISSG in uh, Spine 2016, looking at alignment thresholds based upon normative values for the ODI and the SF36. What we found that is there a linear increase then in SVA as well as a linear increase in lower doses gap for increasing age generations. So you probably don't need quite as much. We need to look further now then into this is what the implications for that for those that are over and under corrected. We then also then presented this uh, this past year uh, at IMAST looking at virtual modeling of patients that are over and under corrected. What we did is we took patients from their fused alignment and then molded together the unfused segments with the fused segments, combined them, and then corrected the pelvic retroversion. Because what we found is if you have alignment here and you have PJK, you retrovert your pelvis. So in fact, the correction was back to here as opposed to really to there, right? And so by then taking these spliced together images and creating a virtual image of these patients, what we found, that's what it looks like from an, uh, uh, a computer modeling standpoint, 
We found that the patients that had PJK were massively overcorrected compared to the no PJK patients. So we're patient, pulling patients way, way back. And again, alignment might not be everything, but that's one of the causes then of junctional failure is patients cannot maintain this new alignment. We also then found do age-adjustive alignment goals have the ability to reduce PJK, then comparing PJK to the no PJK patients. We divided the, the cohort into young adult, middle-aged, and elderly adult, and looked at offsets from normative data. And what we found, again, is that the PJK groups in all groups were brought way back, massively overcorrected from an SVA, low doses gap uh, standpoint, as well as pelvic tilt standpoint compared to the normative patients. The problem, though, is that alignment probably does not tell the whole story. And I think that one of the things that we've done to the ISSG is we've focused so heavily on alignment, I think we're missing some of the other pieces too this puzzle. And so Justin Smith put this out in Jana Spine 2015, looking at best and worst outcomes for ASD surgery. And here's how you define them. And what he found is that the worst case uh, scenario, so here's the, the worst case scenario, really no change in ODI for his best case scenario, big change in ODI, SRS 22R, worst case scenario, no change, best case scenario, change. Based upon the best fit models, right, looking at the worst change, SRS 22R, the predictor for the slope of this line right here was not alignment. So despite us then driving home that alignment makes the big difference, we need to focus on that, that's just a piece of this puzzle. Because the slope of this line, which is theoretically predicting who's, who's going to improve and who's not going to improve, alignment did not factor in. Also, then looking at alignment, the R values for correlation are about 0.5, which is a moderate correlation. But what else is going into the other 0.5 that we're missing? Is it physiology? Is it frailty? Is it smoking? Is it BMI? There's got to be something else. Is it depression that is factoring into this? So then I think in, in conclusion, we've demonstrated that there's a fairly tremendous impact, or at least the ability to do so, from a multi-center study group. And the reason why, then, is that we have this concept, then, of collaborative intelligence. We see that in this small story that adult spine deformity has a very large impact, or at least can, on health, that alignment does matter, we can in theory, in part, predict what that alignment's going to be, but there's some errors in that. But more importantly, though, alignment doesn't tell the entire story. Just like if you implant some kind of implant, right, it's not going to be a panacea for all PJK. There's going to be some other pieces of the puzzle you have to then integrate. So then what we want to then look at going forward, what are we missing? Accurate prom measurement is promised that the, the solution to that. It very well might be. Do we then need to look at patient physiology more via patient frailty? Maybe need to do that as well. And then look at standardization and best practice outcomes for these patients. How can we best do this in a more standardized fashion and identify who's going to benefit and who won't benefit? Thanks.